would like to um, show you a bit uh, a lovely story we've been working on uh, involving very old-fashioned science together with more modern science and uh, how do you we managed to make it uh, to complete it to make a, a successful story so just as a, a brief in introduction my my group uh, works on understanding uh, gene regulation in the context of the chromatin so on the top of the slide here you have this rosary representing all the nucleosome um, at the chromatin state and uh, genes are regulated by two types of uh, regulatory elements the proximal regulatory elements called promoters and the remote regulatory elements called enhancers i define enhancers as a remote control simply uh, influencing the activity of downstream uh, promoters and I say the activity of promoters, yeah, I will tell you in a, in a minute why uh, this word is very important. So enhancers can be located very close to the gene they regulated, sometimes just one to five KB, but sometimes very far away, up to one being a base, so they can jump different transcription units to find a uh, specific target promoter. So over the past uh, probably 20 years now, uh, my input in the field uh, was to show that enhancers are key uh, for many, uh, many aspects. So they are key for uh, re the recruitment of the uh, pol 2 transcription machinery at the target promoters. So enhancers are definitely required for the recruitment of the polymerase to the promoters. Usually you have many enhancers regulating one gene. So those enhancers communicate to each other uh, through chromosomal loop structure. In some cases, promoters can be covered by repressive complexes to a block transcription, and um, enhancers also important for the removal of those repressive complexes. It's the case for the polycom group repressive complexes. And uh, when I mentioned to influence the activity of a promoter, it's not increasing only increasing the rate of transcription, but also the probability of transcription. So these are based on uh, single cell studies. So the model we're working on is the hematopoietic system, simply because uh, it's a very well uh, established uh, model. Uh, we can uh, isolate many uh, cells at different stage of hematopoiesis from hematopoietic stem cells to the fully differentiated cells. And of course, it's a liquid tissue, so it's, it's easily uh, accessible. You can even bleed some colleagues to find, um, you know, different aspects of cell differentiation, something you cannot do with brain tissue, for example. So what we're trying to understand is um, the role of key transcription factors and epigenetic regulators for this process. So the key question here is to understand the lineage specification and the terminal differentiation. So we've been working on different aspects of hematopoiesis. For example, uh, my PhD student at the moment, Camilla, is working on an epigenetic regulators uh, influencing this particular lineage here in monocytes. But today I'm going to concentrate on the erythrate uh, lineage and studying a specific transcription factor we've been working on. So erythropoiesis is a very attractive model simply because, um, you know, it's the formation of red blood cells. So the cells simply get red because they get hemoglobinized. Hemoglobin is a tetramer of two uh, types of proteins, alpha globin and beta globins. And the expression of this gene occurs very late during the process of differentiation in the erythroblast stage. And the expression goes up to the roof simply because the entire nucleus is focused on the production of globins to make those enucleated red blood cells. So you can find different, um, probably several millions of um, uh, alpha and beta globin um, uh, proteins in each uh, erythroblast. So to uh, produce hemoglobin, you need a lot of different transcription factors. So there's two sets of transcription factors. The first set is um, transcription factors that are uh, tissue specific. You can see that these transcription factors are expressed at different stage of differentiation. And a key example is the GATA2, GATA1 switch. So very early, uh, GATA2 is a master regulator opening chromatin at that stage. And when GATA2 um, uh, has opened chromatin of target genes and enhancers, GATA2 will regulate the expression of GATA1. And in return, GATA1 with, will repress GATA2. So there's a switch between GATA2 to GATA1. And much later during erythropoiesis, a key transcription factors called KLF1 or EKLF or erythroid specific KLF will make the final decision between megakaryocytes and erythroblast and uh, will push the cells to the erythroid um, uh, lineage. 
So the, the second set of transition factors are ubiquitously expressed transition factors, but they are very, these are very important um, for making a, a good connection between the, the tissue-specific transcription factors and the general pole to machinery. Many of these are zinc finger proteins uh, from the KLF uh, group or SPX KLF uh, group, including uh, ZBP89, but also other proteins like NFY binding cat box. And I, I go back to, uh, to that in a, in a few um, seconds. So um, the key things we, we've been uh, analyzing in the past, and that's back to my, my, my postdoc uh, back in the day, is to find when and where these transition factors bind during the process of um, cell um, differentiation. So again, the beauty of this model is that we can either isolate primary cells or we have different cell lines representing different stages of differentiation, and you can really study the dynamic of changes in one locus at the time. Of course, these days we do that by chip sequencing, but back in the day we did that by chip qPCR on just one, uh, one locus. And I will summarize uh, what we found. So looking at transcription factor dynamics, so um, again, this is uh, the different progress of uh, the transition between uh, stem cells to um, erythroid cells. And this is a, a cartoon representing the alpha globin locus. So this is 100 KB of genomic DNA. Uh, um, I didn't put any stones over here to simplify a bit the, the, the cartoon. So the first thing to know is that there are two genes in this locus. The first gene is an embryonic gene, uh, the zeta gene, which is not expressed in adult cells, and then uh, the two alpha genes. So these are two genes uh, identical, 99% uh, identical, and these are covered by CPG islands. And CPG islands um, has been shown to uh, recruit a repressive complexes as well. So in non erythroid cells, the gene is repressed by polycom group proteins. But now if we move someone myeloid progenitor, so these cells can be um, uh, can form either megakaryocytes or erythroblast, we have priming of one enhancers called HS minus 40. And that's that's uh, um, really something you find in, in most of genes is that enhancers always primed before promoters. And at that stage, you see the, 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 the purple uh, transcription factor here is actually GATA2, and GATA2 will be subsequently replaced by GATA1. So now if we move to pro erythroblast stage, when the, the cells are really engaged in the erythroid uh, compartment, we have additional hypersensitive size, so HS minus 10, HS minus 48. The numbers here represent the, the, the distance they have compared to these first genes here, but it's uh, about 70 KB between these enhancers and the target genes. And at that particular stage, the promoter um, is cleared from these repressive complexes, and the promoter obviously becomes accessible to transition factor. And the first transition factor that comes in uh, uh, is NFY. NFY has a nucleosome type of structure and could be simply replacing the nucleosome there to make a nucleosome free region. Then if we move to erythroblast, we have an additional um, hypersensitive site here, HS minus 33. I forgot to mention the purple transition factor now is great. This is GATA1 engage because of the GATA switch. And very late, as I explained earlier, we have a key erythroid transition factor involved is EKLF or KLF1. And uh, we also found by doing looping assays that those um, enhancers communicate with each other by the formation of those uh, mini loops. So independent of that, other things happening at the promoter level, we have additional transition factor binding on those GC-rich box um, uh, sequences, uh, such as SP1 uh, and SP3. Then the key other thing we found is that enhancers are also recruiting the polymerase. Now, because of interaction between enhancers and promoter, people may argue that the polymerase found that enhancers could be due because it's interacting with the promoter, and when you do a chromatin immunoprecipitation, you do crossing the complex altogether. But we, we managed to prove that this is not uh, true. And the beauty of the work was to um, having materials from patient where we had either the whole enhancer block here removed or the whole promoter and genes removed. And what we found is that when the, the, the promoter is completely absent, the polymerase is still capable to be recruited to the enhancers, but the other round is not true. So if the enhancers are missing, the polymerase never gets recruited to the promoter. That strongly suggests that the enhancers recruit the polymerase first and then subsequently, boom, this will be uh, transferred to the target promoter. So the work I want to present here is, um, uh, is a bit of a follow-up of this where we've been uh, uh, revisiting the alpha globin promoter. 
to try to find a um, more transcription factor binding there. So before, before I introduce this, I would like to um, go back to something maybe basic, um, and that's a review we, we, we published with Wendy Bickmore here in Edinburgh uh, a few years ago. And I, I really want to advertise uh, this beautiful review um, um, we, uh, we, we, we wrote, not because uh, I just want to advertise myself, but because this review is unique. And I'll tell you why it's unique is because I spent two weeks to calculate the precise size of all those nucleosomes compared to those big complexes of polymerase mediator and general transition factors to see how the, that looks like at the proper scale. And usually people like to show that the nucleosome are those massive rocks uh, in front of the polymerase and the polymerase need to shuffle those rocks uh, to engage in elongation. This is actually not true. Uh, nucleosomes are really small compared to the pol 2 machinery and uh, are the similar size to transcription factors. So uh, although that was six years ago, please do read this review. I, I, I'm sure you're going to learn a lot of different aspects. But the key point I would like to make with uh, this, um, 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 this slide is that when you have a nucleosome-free region covering um, here the promoter, and answers usually cover more than one nucleosome, sometimes two, uh, a nucleosome-free region is about 200 base pairs, and 200 base pairs is actually a lot of space for transcription factor to bind. So it's something to keep in mind. So um, a colleague of mine, David Garrick, who is now based in Paris, um, has been uh, reanalyzing um, the structure of the alpha globin uh, promoter. So this uh, corresponds to 200 base pairs of the promoter. The little uh, arrow here represents the translation start site. We have a um, um, non-conserved uh, Tata box here and a CAD box binding an FY. This has been already described well in the literature. And it's been focusing in this, these two GC uh, rich boxes over here that are very similar and looking at the transition factor binding to this sequence. So back in the day, uh, I'm talking about more than 20 years ago, um, and my, my entire PhD was based on the same type of essay, was to do jet shift experiment. Now, probably the young generation here in the audience uh, may not know what is a gel shift, and I would be in the auditorium, I will ask people to raise their hand uh, to see who doesn't know what is a, a gel shift. But now, thinking with this um, collaborate setting, you can actually raise your hands because you can, you can ask questions as well. So to see who is, who is, uh, who is not shy to, uh, to click the button, raise your hands and tell me if you don't know what uh, is um, a gel shift. I'm on a full screen, so I'm, I'm not, uh, I cannot really uh, see if people will raise their hands. But Stephen, you may tell me uh, if there's at least five, five, I can hear some noise. That's good. OK, so I will explain this. The, the principle, it's, it's, it's very easy. It's an in vitro essay where you generate a, a lot of nuclear extract. Uh, of the cells you want to uh, to analyze. And then you take this small piece of DNA, uh, maybe, I don't know, 20 base pairs, and you label this radioactively. So you mix this um, piece of double-strand DNA with nuclear extract, and if the protein binds to your DNA, you will have a complex. So this is how it looks like on a, on a gel. You have a polyacrylamide gel. The probe will migrate at the bottom of your gel here. It is very radioactive. There was a day we were doing this. I did thousands of gels when I did my PhD. Um, so, but if you mix with uh, a nuclear extract, these are B lymphocytes, you can see different bands. So that means different proteins here binding this, uh, this sequence. And you can do that with different cell types. You cannot do competition with either the same probe in excess 100 fold cold, so non radioactive probes or different mutation. And you can then study the binding of the transcription factors. This is, sounds old-fashioned science, but you will see the beauty uh, of doing those experiments uh, to find something interesting. So this is with the probe uh, 1112. You can see here the two uh, sequences are, are very, very similar. And we found um, three uh, different complexes in B cells and four complexes in k 56 su which is kind of an um, erythroid uh, immortalized cell line. So when uh, David did the same uh, with um, uh, the other probe, he found exactly the same profile, but the complex um, uh, here is a bit stronger here. So I tried to investigate what is this um, uh, complex number four. So the additional um, experiment you can do, if you have a clue or, or you suspect some proteins to be uh, the candidates, you can use antibodies and mixing this with your nuclear extract. And if the antibody recognize this complex, you will increase the size of the complex and then you will super shift those complex or 
the band may simply disappear because the antibody recognized the DNA binding domain. So this is what he did. Uh, he used different antibodies, again, um, different SP, XKLF transcription factors known to bind those GC-rich uh, sequences. He did SP1, and you can clearly see we have an additional spot here of SP1 on the top uh, here. Then SP3, uh, in this case, the band disappeared, and then um, KLF3, also called BAKLF, uh, where the band um, 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 uh, disappeared. So still, uh, we try to find the extra band, uh, EKLF or KLF1, I mentioned earlier, could be a candidate, but um, uh, the antibody didn't react. And also, we know that in K562, KLF1 is almost uh, not expressed. So uh, KLF1 is not the candidate. So still trying to find out what is this complex uh, number four uh, over here. So then uh, they've decided to produce an uh, uh, industrial level of uh, nuclear extra and simply doing a, a chromatin um, a chromatography, a purification chromatography. And that was done in collaboration with Matthias Mann uh, at the Max Planck Institute, who um, uh, did mass spec to identify uh, the candidate uh, protein. We found 50 proteins, and the one that came on the, on the top of the list was mass. So what is mass? Mass uh, means MIC associated zinc finger protein. It is a uh, ubiquitously transcribed uh, protein. It binds DNA through a, a GC-rich uh, sequence, so G3, G3 motifs, and also G4 quadruplex structure. It is regulated by phosphorylation. You can see there's five phosphorylation sites on the top here. Uh, most of time, phosphorylation increases the binding activity of mass. And a uh, fairly recent paper showed that um, knockouts of mass uh, is lethal, so the, the embryo dies around, around birth. So this is the, the, the uh, gene protein uh, structure, just to show that mass is a fairly short gene, uh, has five different exons. Um, Compared to the other SP XKLF transcription factor, it has six zinc finger instead of three. So mass has probably a better um, specificity uh, of DNA binding compared to the other transcription factors. And something to keep in mind, and I'm sure the bioinformatician will be pleased to see that, there are a lot of different mass variants, and that's super important when uh, you think about targeting a gene, you have to make sure you target an exon that is common between all the different variants which makes uh, the story a bit more complicated, but not too much uh, for this part of the work. So then uh, we had to validate if mass was indeed the right candidate. So we did uh, five different uh, ways to uh, validate this. The first um, way to validate it uh, was to uh, knock down mass, to remove mass from the nuclear extract. So at the time we did um, uh, siRNA to deplete most of mass in K562 cells. And you can see that indeed uh, the complex D uh, uh, has disappeared. Then uh, the second validation was to do the opposite experiment. It's using a cell line that where mass is not expressed at very high level. And then we did overexpress mass in those cos uh, cells. You can see a big spot over here. And again, uh, the, the complex uh, is now back uh, here. So this is obviously still in uh, in vitro, and then uh, the key experiment to do in vivo was to look if uh, mass is definitely bind, uh, binding the chromatinized uh, template using chip uh, qPCR. So on the top of the slide, you can see uh, the entire alpha globin locus. This is 100 kb of genomic DNA. The announcers are located in the intron of this neighbor gene, which is a housekeeping gene. And you have the two alpha genes here. And over here, these are all the different um, TACMAN probes we've been designing across the entire locus. And these are the data, the enrichment of mass bound here. You can see that the highest peak is the promoter of the alpha globin uh, over here. But we also find a bit of enrichment of mass at those key regulatory um, elements of alpha globin. So, so far, so good. Everything looks really uh, beautiful. So then we did more functional essays. And uh, the first one to look um, if um, mass uh, down regulation would affect alpha globin expression. So we've been using, again, K562 cells that express uh, uh, mostly um, uh, alpha globin um, uh, and not the, the embryonic globins. And here we've been using two shRNA uh, covering this particular exon that is common with all the different mass variant. And the work was uh, beautifully done uh, by uh, the, the lab of John Frins um, um, in, in Bristol. 
right in the middle of the pandemic. So I can tell you this, this all aspect being extremely stressful uh, for, for, for us. And you can see that, you know, strong down regulation of mass is affecting the effect, uh, the, the expression of uh, alpha globin in, in these cells. The down regulation is obviously modest because keep in mind mass is not the main regulator of alpha globin. Obviously, there are many regulators. So removing one transcription factor only moderately uh, reduced uh, the expression. So this is in a cell line. And of course, the other functional essay would be to, to look uh, in primary cells. So this is a bit more sophisticated experiment because you need to uh, proceed with a differentiation essay and to target the cells at early stage using a lentivirus. So we've been uh, infecting progenitors here called burst forming uh, unit uh, erythroid um, and keeping the cells for 15 days in culture. So the um, differentiation markers we're using here is CD71, which is the transferring receptor expressed uh, at the intermediate stage over here, and then the glycophorin A, which is expressed at much later stage. So in a normal situation, cells will start accumulating these markers and then the fully differentiated one, the GPA, which is what you can see here on the uh, flow cytometry. These are the untransduced cells of the scramble um, um, vectors. You can see the cells reach a fully uh, differentiated stage, but with the two shRNA, you can see a, a drop of um, final uh, differentiated cells with an accumulation of um, progenitors. So on the middle panel, this is just the quantification of the flow cytometry. You can see an increase of the progenitor pool and a decrease of the fully differentiated uh, pool. And of course, the beauty of working with red blood cells is that you can uh, simply appreciate uh, uh, easy a physical phenotype is that the cells themselves look anemic and uh, the, the red pellets uh, become pale. So the cells simply don't differentiate. So because the cells don't differentiate, so they're still blocked in this kind of stage, obviously anything which is downstream will be affected. And that was confirmed by um, um, qPCR looking at the RNA level of uh, both alpha and beta globins. You can see a drop uh, of the two, uh, the two genes over here, but also at the protein uh, levels. So this is all very good. And then, uh, of course, uh, many transition factors involved in erythropoiesis have been found to be um, um, involved in disease uh, affecting alpha or beta, exp uh, beta globin expression. So these are the, the key features of thalassemia. So uh, thankfully, um, uh, because of the beautiful work of uh, one of our scientists here in Roslyn, uh, Albert Teneza generated this gene uh, atlas database. And uh, Dasha, my postdoc, has been looking at um, um, gene atlas, and we found actually three different variants of mass associated with erythroid traits, which really uh, emphasize further the uh, involvement of mass uh, in erythropoiesis. So thanks again to Albert for uh, this uh, beautiful uh, uh, resource. So then, of course, we had um, data with uh, cheap qPCR. So we've been sending this material for sequencing. We could look at uh, the entire genome. So again, we reconfirm our previous data showing by chip sequencing that strongest peak are found on the alpha globin promoters, but also a peak at the, um, the alpha globin regulatory element. Um, it's just minus 40 called um, multi-conserved species regulatory two elements over here, and almost nothing at the beta globin uh, uh, locus. Although we have those very tiny peaks, we did pass the um, peak calling, but um, we suspect this could be a protein-protein interaction rather than direct binding of the DNA. So now go beyond globins now, we have obviously uh, the entire genome uh, to look at. This is what we, we found. Um, and again, uh, the work, uh, everything was done from this part um, by Dasha Dean, uh, who was my postdoc in Roslyn, um, who left um, quite recently. So most of mass peak, we found in total 10,000 peaks, and most of peaks are found at the promoter regions, but then the second big class of region uh, where you can find mass are intergenic region or intronic regions. We are most of the time are also enhancers. So these are the two main uh, regions where we found mass peaks. And then by collecting all those peaks, you can do a motif analysis and uh, using MEME. And what we found is um, a mass bind mostly uh, a G3, a G4 a motif, and not G3, the G3, as it was previously uh, explained in the literature. So uh, this is the motif we found. 
So G3, G4, unfortunately, I don't have, we don't have the 5G uh, for you guys, but that's what we found in most, uh, in most of peaks. And then we've been looking at mass signal compared to other key uh, genomic features. We've been looking at open chromatin region uh, by ATAC-seq. Uh, you can see uh, um, a correlation between mass signal and open region of the chromatin, a correlation with trimethyl K4 marking promoters, and also um, um, acetylation of lysine 27, which marks both enhancers and active promoters, uh, correlation with the polymerase and inverse correlation with the repressive mark, which is the mark uh, deposited by the polycom group protein I mentioned a bit earlier. And something not included in the paper uh, is uh, a correlation with CTCF. There are two papers um, that should be online very soon. Uh, showing that mass uh, also interact with CTCF in a, in a subpopulation uh, of peaks uh, as well. So mass could also have a role in um, uh, the global uh, chromatin uh, architecture. So then um, uh, Dasha uh, looked at uh, some ENCODE uh, data and ENCODE uh, thankfully did some chip sequencing with mass in other cell types. And you have here, uh, these are hepatocytes, lung cells, uh, B cells, and, and breast cancer cells. And um, I forgot uh, which one is the, the last one here. And um, she has defined two types of peaks, those uh, called the common peaks. Common peaks are peaks that are in common at least between two different cell types. And then the erythrospecific peaks that only specific in erythrogenage, and these are the ones here at the bottom. So that's 17% of the peaks. And we found that all those peaks are located in key erythroid genes, perfectly uh, fitting or um, previous data showing that mass is important for erythropoiesis. So to push this uh, a little bit further, she's been um, looking at uh, the proportion of um, peaks found in promoters versus enhancers. And uh, something interesting she found is that in uh, the common peaks, apparently most of mass peaks are found at promoter region and uh, much less to enhancers. But in the Detroit specific pool, it's the opposite situation where most of peaks are found in the regulatory elements. So it appears that mass is very important at enhancers uh, regulatory region in Detroit lineage emphasizing more its role as a regulatory protein rather than just a housekeeping um, uh, transcription factor binding to, just to promoters. So this is a correlation we found with different genomic features at the non-TSS set. So they are obviously a stronger mass enrichment. Um, um, uh, the, the peaks are stronger uh, in the erythroid set. We have a stronger correlation with open chromatin region again, and uh, a strong uh, correlation with monomethyl K4, which is specific of um, enhancers. We don't find these at promoters. And indeed, uh, the mark of promoters, in, there's an, a reverse correlation with mass binding. So that strongly suggests that mass is important uh, for um, enhancers activities in uh, red blood cells. So then uh, the last thing that Dasha has been looking at is um, to make any correlation between mass and a key um, master regulator in erythroid cells. And I mentioned GATA1 uh, earlier on. So uh, what uh, she found is that um, if you look um, um, uh, uh, mass at promoters uh, occupied by GATA1, there's a correlation at the promoter, but this correlation is even stronger at the enhancers over here. And the, uh, the reverse situation is also true. If you look at um, GATA in the mass pool, we saw, we saw um, a correlation of the promoters, but the correlation was even stronger at the enhancers um, uh, pool as well. So up to uh, 86%. Uh, so the work uh, was uh, actually accepted recently uh, and still not online at the moment, but um, is being uh, accepted in blood uh, advance. So in conclusion, uh, we use an unbiased approach leading to the identification of mass as a transcription factor controlling the erythroid uh, program. Uh, originally by looking at mass binding to the alpha globin promoter in vitro and in vivo, and we found that it's definitely required for erythropoiesis. Clinical significance, we found mass variant associated with erythroid clinical traits. That's um, because of the gene atlas um, database we've been looking at. And uh, by chip sequencing, we found that actually um, 
uh, many erythroid genes are regulated by, by mass, and we found um, uh, an association with GATA1 binding uh, at those uh, enhancers. So now whole mass regulate erythropoiesis, and that's where um, the, the, the model gets a bit complicated because we found that actually mass regulates, as I uh, say earlier, erythroid genes. So GATA1 gene itself and KLF1 genes are occupied by mass, and this is um, an example of the chip sequencing we found. This is the KLF1 promoter. And what is also complicated is all those KLF um, um, protein uh, regulate the expression of each other. So to understand um, why different protein can, can compete for the same binding sequence based on the gel shift uh, we, we found earlier, understanding what's the archy and at what time uh, these um, protein uh, compete with each other is something we need, we need to find out um, in, in, the, in, in the future. With this, I will, I will stop and thanks the, all the people involved in the, in the work. So Dasha Dean, my postdoc, uh, who's been um, completing this beautiful paper, um, and Dasha is now a senior bioinformatician at the University of Newcastle. David Garrick at the University of Paris, Diderot, uh, who initiated uh, the work. Matthias Mann and Fag Butter at the Max Planck for the mass spec uh, aspect. And all the uh, primary retort cells were completed um, by Jean Frain and her team uh, in the middle of uh, um, the, the pandemic last year. And obviously my, my, my former lab uh, uh, where David Garrick initiated the work and uh, Michel Holland who gave a, a talk a few months ago over here who was also um, involved in this. And there's this beautiful Roslyn uh, in May last year, right uh, in the middle of the lockdown. So when it was completely empty and um, I keep advertising to people, says the bad weather in Scotland is not what you think. And this is um, an average picture uh, you can find every day um, uh, when you come over. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to any question, obviously. Thank you.